Hello everyone, and in this video, we are going to be talking about the goldman hodgkin katz or GHK equation. And so this is a pretty big equation, but I think it's really important to just focus on the purpose and the motivation for knowing this. And that is for us to model the membrane potential of a cell at different ionic concentrations so we can determine the direction of ionic flux and magnitude. And so I know that's a lot of words, but really what this is saying is that we want to figure out if we know the concentration of the potassium outside of a cell, we should be able to know exactly which way and how much the potassium will want to enter or leave a cell. And we should be able to do that for sodium and chloride as well. And so the thing that the goldman hodgkin katz equation is trying to model here is how these cells in your body change their membrane potential at different ionic concentrations. And this is not something that's easy to do, and that's the reason why we've got so many terms here, because your cells have specialized to be selectively permeable at selective times for certain ions. So unlike the Nernst equation, which only looked at potassium, which is an oversimplification, for lower concentrations of ions, the Nernst equation fails to accurately predict what the cell's membrane potential will be, and that's the reason why the goldman hodgkin katz equation is a better model to use in all cases for these purposes. And so the reason it is, is for the following. So I've written out the goldman hodgkin katz equation in light blue here, and so what we're seeing is that we've got Vm, and this, by the way, has units of millivolts, is equal to RT, the ideal gas constant, times the temperature, divided by the Faraday constant, F. And this term right here, I just want to make note that because temperature is usually constant inside of your cells, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, um, this is something that typically will lump all these constant terms into that coefficient out front. And this stuff right here is just equal to 61.5, and I apologize for the screen, but um, we get the gist, is that all these constant terms inside of this will be equal to 61.5, and then when we set it to that constant, um, I wanna make note that this is log base 10 times that inner argument. Uh, and so sometimes if you didn't make that simplification to say that this was equal to 61.5, you might see natural log, but for our intents and purposes, especially when we're talking about living things and human cells that are all at the same temperatures, you're gonna commonly see just this 61.5 term out front. Um, but I wrote out the entire equation just so we can all see it. So 61.5 is that coefficient of constants. Uh, and then the units are in millivolts and we are going to be using log base 10 as this argument, not natural log. If you did um, use RT over Faraday's constant, uh, then you would use natural log. But in our case, 61.5 helps simplify the math slightly. Um, and so with that out of the way, um, this is where the goldman hodgkin katz equation becomes a lot more better at predicting the cell's membrane potential than the Nernst equation. And the reason for that is because of these terms that we're seeing here, and I'll try to use uh, good colors to pull this out, but note how we've got these P sub K, P sub NA, P sub CL, so these are the relative permeabilities um, of the different ions. I'll try to spell it correctly, relative permeabilities. And this is permeability. Um, and so these are ratios between zero and one. And so in the case of potassium K, this guy PK is equal to 1.0. Why is it equal to 1.0? Is because your cell literally has membrane, uh, has these ion channels that are wide open for potassium all the time in most cells. And so in a common cell, we are going to expect that the potassium is going to be very easy to enter and leave the cell as it pleases. And because of that, the permeability of, or the permeability coefficient of potassium is going to be 1.0. 1. When you look at a typical cell and you think about the permeability coefficient of uh, sodium, this guy is actually equal to only 0 0.01, so literally one hundredth that of potassium. And then when you look at something like 
uh, chlorine, those chloride ions, these guys are equal to 0 0.10. And so that is one tenth that of the potassium because for sodium and chloride, unlike potassium, your cells don't have these wide open protein channels for them. Um, and so it's a lot less permeable. It's a lot harder for a sodium to naturally come into a cell than it is for a potassium, which has a wide open door for it because of those uh, protein channels. And so with that, that's one thing to take away from this equation. The next thing to take away from this equation is the following. So make note of how we are comparing the concentration of these potassium ions in the outside of the cell, this little O here. You can also think of this as the extracellular fluid. So everything outside of that cell is gonna be that O outside. And then we have, sorry, we have this guy right here, which is the concentration of the potassium, which is this I term. And this is the intracellular fluid, ICF. And so that's basically whatever concentration of potassium currently exists inside of your cell. And so this applies for the sodium as well as the chloride ions as well. Um, I do want to make note here that we flip the uh, out over in concentrations to uh, relative for chloride ions because these chloride ions carry a negative charge, whereas the sodium and the potassium have that positive charge. So do make note of that, that with these guys, um, there is that difference because of that difference in charge. And I, I'll try to keep all these things together. Um, but yeah, so that is the key thing to take away from this. And so this is that equation. And for our intents and purposes, again, 61.5 is usually a pretty good coefficient to use because your cells are usually around that constant temperature and the ideal gas constant isn't gonna change anytime soon, nor is the Faraday constant. So this VM term is uh, pretty good for our intents and purposes. So now, what do you do with this thing? Like, why is it helping us? And you know, why, why spend so much time on it? So now what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the effect of how varying these concentrations of ions will change the membrane potential of a cell. And this helps us understand why a condition called hyperkalemia or hypokalemia is so severe relative to something like hyponatremia or hypernatremia, which refers to um, differences in the chlorine, I'm sorry, the uh, potassium as well as the sodium respectively. And so um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to uh, just kind of do a ceteris paribus, say we're gonna hold everything else equal. And I'm going to say that uh, the following. So if we knew that the concentration of K plus on the outside of our cell was 4.5 millimolar, and we did the Nernst equation and we found out that the potential for, or the equilibrium potential for potassium specifically is gonna end up being minus 87.6 uh, millivolts, and this is at the cell's temperature and pressure, what we're gonna see is that when we plug this into our uh, equation, and I do wanna also make this note here that the concentration of potassium inside our cell is going to be 120 millimolars. And I'll just take a little stop here, a little uh, quick little detour. Note how, because, so earlier we were saying that the permeability of potassium is 1.0, like it's really high because your cell has these wide open doors for potassium to come and go as it pleases. Why is there this difference between the concentration of potassium inside and outside of that cell? That's because your cell is actively using ATP to make this a thing. It is actively pumping potassium into the cell from outside the cell to have this gradient in the first place. And because of this gradient, that's the reason why you end up with this minus 87.6 millivolts uh, equilibrium potential for potassium because of all that ATP that your cell is expending to maintain this difference in concentration of these potassium ions. So with that, uh, what we are going to take away from this is that under these conditions, with these conditions, the membrane potential of our cell is going to be the following. So it's, if you plug this in and 
I'm sorry I'm doing some hand waving here with the math, but uh, for us to understand the purpose of the GHK equation, we need to. Um, basically, what you end up seeing is that the membrane potential at these conditions uh, with 4.5 uh, millimolar of potassium on the outside, we have a membrane potential in a, of our cell of minus 75 millivolts. And so uh, that is, let's say this happens at T equals zero seconds. I'll try to write that out. So now let's say uh, the following happens where we're at T equals one second. So this is a different point in time. But now at this different point in time, uh, the concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid, which is the outside of the cell, then decreases to two millimolar. What is gonna happen in this case is uh, we're going to assume that the concentration of potassium inside the cell is held constant because your cells are actively pumping this thing in. Um, what we see happen is that the equilibrium potential for potassium is now going to be minus 109.3 millivolts and our membrane potential of our cell due to the change of the concentration of the potassium outside of the cell is now going to be minus 85 millivolts and so the key thing to see here is that this change of going from 4.5 millimolar to 2 millimolar of potassium outside of the cell dramatically changed the cell's membrane potential. So by 10 millivolts, this change, this decrease of the extracellular potassium changed, uh, and this was only a, you know, relatively a small decrease because we're going from 4.5 to two, so that's 2.5 millimolar decrease of potassium outside of the cell, but it resulted in changing our membrane potentials by 10 millivolts, which is a lot. Um, and so, you know, how do you know that's a lot? What are we comparing this to? So if we ran a similar experiment here where we did the same thing, but with the sodium ions. So if sodium on the outside of our cell was 120 millimolar, and um, I'm gonna do a little bit of hand waving here and say we, you know, we don't need to think about the uh, the internal concentration of sodium right now, but basically the thing to take away here is that the equilibrium potential of these sodiums is going to end up being 55.5 millivolts. What we see is that the cell's membrane potential, everything else equal, those potassium ions aren't changing, is going to be equal to minus 75.8 millivolts. Now, if we change the sodium to uh, the following, where we increase this guy to 145 millimolar, so like if you just had a really salty bag of fries or something and your blood sodium levels just increased a lot, what happens to the uh, equilibrium potential of sodium is that it will increase to 60.5 millivolts. And at the end of the day, what this causes is a change in the cell's membrane potential of, it, it makes the cell's membrane potential, I'm sorry, minus 75.0 millivolts. And so the thing that I'm trying to hit home here is that with this, we had a 15, so we added 15 millimolar of sodium, and this resulted in a only a 0 0.8 millivolt change in our cell's membrane potential. And so this is dramatically less than the change that we saw in our cell's membrane potential when we only decreased the amount of potassium ions from 4.5 to 2. So a 2.5 millimolar change in the potassium resulted in a 10 millivolt change of our cell's membrane potential relative to this 0 0.8 millivolt potential change that happened from increasing the amount of uh, extracellular sodium by 15. 
or I'm sorry, that's 25, so it's actually even more. And so the question here is, why is this number so much bigger for potassium than it is for sodium? And the answer to that is that the permeability of the potassium is significantly more than that of the potassium, I'm sorry, of the sodium. And so this 1.0 versus 0 0.01, that 100 fold difference in permeability between potassium and sodium is the reason why something like, in this case, this would be called hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is so uh, damaging to a person because it affects the ability of your cells to reach their threshold potential to fire uh, a neuron, for instance. And so maintaining the extracellular levels of the potassium are extremely important for your cell to be able, and your body as a whole, to be able to make sure that your neurons and your skeletal muscle cells are able to still create action potentials and reach the thresholds that they would with the normal amount of stimulus that's needed. And so what happened in this case, when we went from minus 75 millivolts to minus 85 millivolts, is we just hyperpolarized a neuron. And by hyperpolarizing a neuron, that means that you're going to need to have an even bigger stimulus to get that neuron to get to its threshold potential at which the action potential will fire. And so that means that signals that typically would have made a neuron fire are no longer enough to make that neuron fire. And this will have very damaging consequences to a patient because of that. And so I know this was definitely a very dense, long video, but I hope this makes sense. Uh, and thank you all for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. I hope everyone out there is doing well, and I will talk to you guys next time.